Japan and the United States have requested an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council later today after North Korea fired a missile that flew over Japan. The missile flew over the island of Hokkaido before it crashed into the sea off the country's east coast. Well, the launch prompted an alert and people were told to take cover in basements or in concrete buildings. The Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, said the launch was an unprecedented, serious and grave threat to his nation. North Korea has fired rockets over Japan twice in the past, once in 1998 and again in 2009. But on those occasions, Pyongyang claimed that they were satellite launches, not weapons. Just before midnight, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson tweeted that he was outraged by what he called North Korea's reckless provocation. Meanwhile, the Chinese government says the United States and South Korea are partly responsible for pressuring North Korea, questioning whether all parties were pushing for peace. Our correspondent Yogita Lamai reports on the latest North Korean missile launch. Japan being woken up by a siren on Tuesday morning as a North Korean missile flew over the country. The rocket was launched from near Pyongyang and it flew over the northern island of Hokkaido before splitting into three parts and landing into the sea to the east. It's just the latest in a series of military missile tests conducted by North Korea this year, but a more serious one because it flew over Japan. The last time that happened was nearly two decades ago. Their outrageous act of firing a missile over our country is an unprecedented, serious and grave threat, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said. At a U.S. base near Tokyo, a military drill was conducted by Japanese forces in response to the missile launch. Across the sea in South Korea, joint exercises are underway with American troops. They are held every August and North Korea usually responds with a show of strength. Last year, it conducted a nuclear test in retaliation. This year, it's flown a missile that had the potential to cause serious harm. A strong message that despite international pressure, Pyongyang has no intention to stop. Yogo Talamai, BBC News, Seoul. And our correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes is in Tokyo. You can imagine people waking up here to the sound of air raid sirens and being told to find shelter in concrete buildings or basements is not a normal occurrence uh, for people in Japan. In fact, as far as I'm aware, I think this is the first time this has happened perhaps since the Second World War. People have been practicing the last few months in towns up and down the coast of Japan because of the increased uh, number of missile tests by North Korea. But this is the first time that it's happened for real, that you know, the public address system is being used to tell people there's a missile flying in our direction, find shelter. So this is a very serious and very aggressive thing for North Korea to do. Countries do not normally fire ballistic missiles across the territory of their neighbours. And that's why we've seen this very angry uh, response from the Japanese government, from Prime Minister Abe, calling this an act of violence, saying it's unprecedented, uh, and uh, speaking to President Trump and them together, saying they will now take this to the UN Security Council and demand action from you know, the world community, especially from countries like China and Russia. Well, let's get reaction now from Beijing. Stephen McDonnell is there for us. Hello to you, Stephen. China saying that efforts towards resuming those talks over North Korea's nuclear weapons program have reached a tipping point as a result of this. Analyze that statement for us. How much friction exactly is there now between Beijing and Pyongyang? Well, it's interesting. China, whenever there's one of these tests from North Korea says that all parties should remain calm and that no one should do anything to escalate the situation. And we had that again today from the Chinese foreign ministry. But there was something else. They're really blaming the US and South Korea for pressuring North Korea into carrying out this test. And that's because, as we heard before, the US and South Korea are having these big war games. Now, China says the military exercises should stop in exchange for North Korea halting its missile program, at least halting the, the testing uh, at the moment of the missile program. But China also says that the UN resolutions, apart from calling for sanctions, also call for all parties to move towards peace talks. 
and it's questioned rhetorically whether or not everybody, and it means by this the US and South Korea, whether everybody is really heading towards these peace talks. Can China bring any more influence to bear, do you think, on North Korea and what it does next? I think there's no doubt that China can pile more pressure on North Korea. I mean, it is the biggest trading partner by a long shot with North Korea. And everything that China does by way of sanctions hurts the DPRK. Now, China has said today it's going to maintain these sanctions program as long as it's agreed to the, to the sanctions at the United Nations. But the BBC asked, for example, would they back more sanctions? And the Chinese government has said, well, that's a, you know, a hypothetical question. We can't really say whether we would do that. Mm. But they've stressed they don't think sanctions are the answer and that really we need to move towards peace talks uh, to provide some sort of long-term solution. OK, Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen McDonnell in Beijing for us. And with me now is Professor Robert Kelly, Professor of Political Science at Busan National University in South Korea. It's very good to have you with us. Uh, diplomacy, sanctions downright criticism and very strong words from some nations. None of this has stopped North Korea carrying out another missile launch. What do you think has prompted it to, uh, to fire this latest missile over Japan? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, a couple of things. One, I think North Korea is probably more confident than in the past that these kinds of provocations, this is a pretty big one, um, won't be punished because North Korea is now a nuclear missile power. Um, the uh, governments around the world, the relevant governments, particularly South Korea, Japan, the United States, will not say that. Nobody wants to actually sort of formally put that in print. But, you know, North Korea is here now with a nuclear missile, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about it. Um, and I think that probably gives them a certain amount of confidence they can get away with more stuff. Also, the North Koreans like to provoke during um, the American South Korean drills and exercises. There's a big one going on right now. It's called Ulchi Freedom Guardian, and this is all about interoperability and scenarios for conflict with North Korea. The North Koreans claim that these are rehearsals for invasion. They're not, but the North Koreans like to you know, sort of respond in some way, and missile tests have sort of been one of their favorites. So this is something we kind of expect. Not this particular thing shooting over the islands, but something is pretty typical. So do you think that sanctions just aren't working? No, actually, I don't. And I, th I think the sanctions sort of get an unfair rap on this. Um, I think the proper counterfactual for sanctions is not, well, they shouldn't have a nuclear program at all because the sanctions work well. It's rather how much worse would the nuclear program be if we didn't have sanctions? That is to say, you know, you hear people kick around that they might have 50 or 60 warheads now, well, maybe they'd have 200 if we didn't have the sanctions. So I would argue that the sanctions stay in place. We need to start going after North Korean money, particularly North Korean money and Chinese banks. That's the big, I think that's sort of the big goal out there. Um, but no, we, we shouldn't let up and we should keep going back to the UN Security Council. I mean, there's really no good kinetic options, right? Talking to North Korea is probably not going to work. We should try that too. I don't really see much choice, but they continue to do what we're doing, which is the UN and missile defense. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit more. What do you think the response is going to be from South Korea, from Japan, which beyond the rhetoric has traditionally, uh, you know, kept a relatively low profile on this matter? What right. do you think the response is going to be this time? Yeah, I mean, it's really sort of on Japan now to sort of find some kind of way to respond to this, right? As your correspondence previously pointed out, North Korea has only done this twice before. Um, this time it really was sort of obviously a ballistic missile to what the previous ones were too. But this really is about terrorizing Japanese civilians, and it's hard to be a serious government without some kind of response. If I had to guess in Japan, this will really improve the position of hawks in Japan who want missile defense. Um, Japan does not have, for example, a THAAD battery, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense battery, which now exists in South Korea to protect against these kinds of strikes. I would imagine there'll be pressure in Japan to get that, too. Um, in general, I think this is sort of the strategic race in Asia you'll see in the next decade or so with North Korea. As the North Koreans build more missiles, there's going to be an increasing amount of pressure for missile defense, and so you're going to kind of, you'll get a kind of arms race around that. And in terms of resuming any sort of talks over North Korea's nuclear weapons program, what of that route? Does that stand, stand any chance of, of, of any success? Yeah, probably not. Um, the North Koreans have put a huge amount of money into getting a nuclear weapon. North Korea's GDP is only about 35 to 40 billion dollars, um, considering, uh, depending what statistic you take, right? That's really not a lot of money for a program this complicated. I've heard numbers thrown around as high as 8% of GDP has gone into this program. So they're not going to give it up without some massive concession. And it's just not one the United States is going to give. The United States is not going to unilaterally pull out of North and South Korea or something like that.
right? So the talks probably won't really go very far. We should keep trying. Maybe we can get some small concessions. We may make small changes. But, you know, we've been talking to the North Koreans about their nuclear program since the early 1990s. And it's always been sort of two steps forward, then one to the right and three back and the rest of it. And it's kind of never really gone anywhere. We should keep trying, but we should be very skeptical that there's some big, you know, so some grand agreement at the end of this. Okay, Professor Kelly, thank you very much for your time today. Professor Robert Kelly, uh, Professor of Political Science at Busan National University in South Korea.